Right, we'll make a start. This is Paul McKinney, and I'll hand straight over to him. Thank you. Okay, so I've uh, been working on some on user level things for quite some time, and a couple things have changed. One thing is that I actually finally, after five and a half years, uh, last spring, got permission to actually release some of these. Um, you can work out the math and figure out what might have been involved there, uh, and if you can't, uh, somebody else might be able to tell you. Um, and uh, in the process of doing that, uh, I've had some experiences that have indicated that we really need user-level test structure for some RCU algorithms, and we'll talk about that in the talk. This is kind of an overview of where we're going. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through that, aside from talking about it. And uh, the first question, and I talked about this a little bit on Monday for those of you who are here, is why bother with concurrency at all? And that's kind of an unfashionable question, but it's all the more important because of that. If we don't know why we're using concurrency, and if we don't have good answers for it, then we don't really know what we should be doing about it. The three reasons I've come up with, and we could debate on this, I'm, uh, I'm happy to do that afterwards, uh, higher performance. If the performance of a single CPU is enough for you, run single-threaded, be happy. All right, so I assert that anybody who's doing multi-core, doing parallel programming, shared memory parallel programming, has to be trying to resolve a performance problem. Uh, Non-shared memory parallel programming, there's some things where you might get extra resilience, but, but believe me, if you have shared memory, um, the isolation isn't there, and, and if somebody fails, everybody fails, for the most part. Acceptable productivity. Uh, parallel machines are now extremely cheap. They're much, much less expensive than a used car. When I still got into parallel first, they were much more expensive than my house. It is no longer possible to hide several months of programmer effort behind the cost of the machine. It used to be that after you spent a million dollars on your machine, so you, you know, gave somebody a couple hundred thousand dollars to you know, program it, okay, you know, that's still small on a machine. Try that with a couple hundred dollar netbook or, or laptop you might get that has dual core. You, you're not going to fit much time behind that, and uh, I'm keeping myself awake here. Very awake, as it turns out. <laughs> okay. And uh, the other thing is reasonable generality. The more general purpose your application, your program, your framework, your kernel, the more users there are to spread the work doing it, the cost of doing it, depending on what kind of program you're working with. <laughs> of course, um, this is actually, for me, has been a big deal uh, because it's fun to do it. And if you're a hobbyist and it's fun, don't worry about these reasons. Just do it. Have some fun. Of course, um, you may have to check, may, maybe, maybe not, need to check with your manager, your professor, your significant other, you know, wife, kids, whatever. They may have a different opinion, but you know, um, I'll let you worry about that. Now, one thing to be careful of. Uh, I haven't mentioned anything about reliable software up here. And that's because you know, it better be reliable, but just like single-threaded software had better be reliable. If you don't care about it being reliable, this is really simple and really fast, OK? Just return zero. Just you know, hand back zero. That's your answer, and, and it'll be really fast. Uh, doesn't have to be parallel. Uh, you can't get much faster than that. Uh, but the, getting the right answer might be important in some contexts, in which case this solution may not apply. OK. Um, and it turns out that if you look around at what people are doing, oftentimes they'll do a lot of work to make something parallel and have a lot of difficulty there'll be poor performance. And we'll talk about, in a little lighthearted manner, why that might be the case. This is kind of the marketing pitch. We're going to have multi-core systems. They're all going to be running full out, just on a track, clear field. It'll be great. That's the marketing pitch. The reality is a little bit different, and it has been for decades. The thing is that the CPUs are not running on a nice, flat, well-marked track. They're really running an obstacle course. What kind of obstacles might they run into? There's a good one. Memory references. Why do the CPUs have these big caches? They have the big caches because memory is really, really slow. So as soon as you have a memory reference that is not already in cache, your performance is gone for some period of time. It has to wait. Wait for that to go out and get to memory and for the memory to figure out that it needs to hand the value back and for the value to come back. Hundreds of instructions, sometimes thousands. Another thing is uh, branch mispredictions. 
So that happens. Um, it's, it's kind of read ahead to figure out where to go, and suddenly, wham, that was the wrong way. We've got to go this other way. And that can consume lots of cycles as it puts itself back together and fetches the instructions from the other path and, and, and gets it all set up and fills the pipeline again. A third problem you can run into is atomic instructions. And uh, you know, they, they seem so innocent. They're single instructions, compare and swap, atomic increment. But uh, they aren't. They aren't. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, we got, it's, it's an old style atom. This is the kind of way you might see atoms drawn when I was uh, you know, maybe your age or younger, right? Uh, but uh, what, I, I don't do the art. I don't do art very well. This is my daughter's representation. I can take it up with her if you have objections, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of like it. Uh, memory barriers. Uh, what happens to get performance, because these memory references are so slow, the CPUs will execute instructions out of order. You know, they're waiting for this memory reference, but they can go do these other things in the meantime and then finally catch up and do the memory reference. Well, sometimes that isn't the right thing to do. Like, uh, you really don't want to start executing the critical section until you've actually got the lock. Okay? Um, that's the whole point of the lock is to protect this instructions. So we have things called memory barriers to let the CPU know, by the way, uh, you know, don't go into the critical section until you got the lock, please. And, of course, that messes up your performance. And uh, another one is cache misses. This is related to the memory references. If you have a memory reference that is in the cache, you've got a cache miss. But it's also possible that a cache miss for some data that's really hot in the cache, because it might be in somebody else's cache. Okay? So this lock you're trying to get, well, somebody else just released it. The data structure covering that lock is in the other guy's cache. That means you get to wait until it shows up while everybody else is going running past you. And finally, uh, don't even get me started on, on I.O., all right? You do an RPC somewhere, I mean, you know, it's forever. Disk access, even with SSDs, you know, SSDs are really fast. They're only 20 microseconds or 30 microseconds or whatever. Of course, that's if it's wired right into the CPU bus. Um, and also, that's a lot of instructions. That's tens of thousands of instructions with today's CPUs. So. These are all reasons why it's very easy to make a program parallel and have it go a lot slower than the original single-threaded program ran. And one of the main reasons to go parallel is to make it go faster, so we'd like to take some other approach to life. I'm not going to go into this in great detail. This is just one particular CPU. There are newer ones that are somewhat faster. Um, but the basic thing to take out of this is here's a clock period. Here's a, an atomic operation that misses the cache, 500 to 1. Okay, That's where the toilet paper roll comes in. With the American toilet paper, uh, you end up with one square of toilet paper and somewhere around 450 or so squares for the rest of the roll. And uh, one square versus the whole thing strung out is impressive. OK, so all of this is just why we would have something like RCU. And the reason is that RCU majors in things up here. And a lot of other synchronization mechanisms are down here. Now, uh, of course, that there's more to it than that RCU is very specialized. It's used only in some places. But uh, nonetheless, where it does apply, it works out quite nicely. So I'm not going to go into too much detail in this. What I'm going to do instead is focus on a couple diagrams just showing how it's used to give a flavor for it. Um, one thing you can do is you can insert a new element into a list. We're going to use something very trivial here where we just have a list that can only have one element. We have a global pointer. We're advancing through time doing operations. We start off with a null global pointer. There's nothing hanging off of it. And we're going to do a bunch of things and eventually get to where we have a global pointer pointing to some data structure here filled out. And we're going to do that operation in such a way that readers can be dereferencing this global pointer at any point in time without grabbing locks, without slowing up, just going straight through the global pointer. And this is a useful approach if you have a data structure that's read a huge number of times and written extremely seldomly. A, uh, the classic case of this in the Linux kernel would be the routing tables. Routing updates are extremely rare. If somebody takes out some big part of the internet, yes, you may have to send your packets somewhere else. But you're going to be sending a huge number of packets for each time that happens. Okay. Now, these are color coded. The red stuff is stuff that's dangerous. A reader might be looking at that at any time, and you don't know whether a reader's looking there or not. The green stuff. Um, these piece and this piece are things that the guy doing the update has sole access to. Readers can't possibly look at it. So we go through a process here. We start off with nothing there. We, we, we have to have some way of protecting against multiple people updating, and I'm leaving that aside. Maybe use a lock. Maybe there's only one 
task and do the update, whatever it is, we allocate something. So we get this data structure here. Readers can't get at it. The values are whatever they are. It's not been initialized. Next thing we do is we initialize it. So we have these values now set out nicely. And uh, the pointer still does not point to it, so readers still cannot access it. And then we use a primitive called RCU assign pointer, which makes the pointer point to it in such a way that the readers are guaranteed to see the new values as opposed to somehow ending up with those values. And I'm not going to go through why that can happen. It took the alpha architects like two hours convincing me that it could about 10 years ago. And uh, just trust me, OK? Now, we also have to worry about deletion. And I'm going to go through this as well. And here we have a list. We start off with a list. We have elements A, B, and C on the list. And we're going to go through a series of steps to remove element B. OK, we're going to put just A and C at the end. And again, we're going to do this in such a way that readers can go charging through this list at any time, totally oblivious to the fact that we're changing the list without having to acquire locks or do anything unusual like that. Again, if we have a list that is being changed, it could be changed at any time, but is very rarely changed and read a whole bunch. Configuration data, for example, of routing tables we already mentioned, security information is often this way, then this can be an advantage. Again, this is special purpose. We don't use it everywhere. OK, so again, the color coding is there. Red is stuff that readers can access at any time. A new reader could show up at any time. Yellow stuff is stuff that readers might be accessing, but new readers can't possibly get to it, only old readers, OK? Because at this point, there's no path to it. And green stuff are things that readers can't possibly have an access to, and we can do whatever we want with it at that point. So we start off with this list. We just use a list deletion primitive. We remove it from the list. At that point, it's still sort of there. Now, A's pointer points around it. Its next pointer still points to C. So a new reader can't find it. But there could be a reader who just right here picked up this pointer. And then before they did anything else, we did the deletion. And they, would, they haven't accessed it yet, but they're going to sometime in the future. So what we have to do is we have to wait for all of these readers to get done. And RCU has a primitive synchronized RCU that allows that. I'm not going to go into great detail today on how that works. Uh, later on, I'll have some URLs that you can look at that go through that in, in good detail. But once this magic primitive gets done, all these readers are gone. And we have this LMB. Nobody, nobody can get to it anymore. And nobody's there anymore. So nobody's referencing it. We can therefore safely free it and end up with just this list we wanted to at the end. Okay? And the readers have to be using, have to be taking some care. They have to use RCU dereference when they pick up a pointer. Okay, for technical reasons. Again, it's, it has to do with the thing the alpha architects were beating me over the head with some years ago. Plus, it, it's a way of preventing the compiler writers from messing us up as well. And they also have to use an RC read lock before they start going through the list. And when they get done with the list, they use RC read unlock. Now, these don't necessarily generate any code. If you make these will just turn into nothing. The compiler won't even see them. There's pound sign define, RC read lock, preempt disable. And somewhere else, there's pound sign define, preempt disable, new line. And uh, again, I'm not going to go through how that works. We'll have some URLs. People can, can look at that. So the basic way RCU works is that we have this time sequence going through. We make a change, and we make a change live, kind of a hot change, if you will, kind of like working on the electricity with the breaker still on so that you have to use rubber, rubber handled screwdriver and rubber shoes. Um, so we make the change. We wait for what's called a grace period. We wait for all the readers to drain out. And once that grace period finishes, we know that there can't be any readers looking at our data structure anymore. And we can then make changes uh, that are destructive in nature that readers can't tolerate, freeing things, for example. So the readers are happening concurrently. So we have an RC read lock to begin. We have RC read references in the middle, and an RC read unlock at the end, as shown over there. And this is OK because he got done before we even started. This guy's OK because he started, but he finished before the end of the grace period. So he may have gotten the data we're trying to get rid of, but he left before we did anything to it. Similarly, this guy, I mean, he, he left right at the end, but still, um, he let go of anything before we did anything. This guy's OK because he started after we did the removal. So he can't possibly see the thing we removed. This is an error. If you have something like this, he, he might see the stuff we were trying to remove, and he might be still messing with it, 
while we're trying to free it. So this, if this happens, you have a buggy RCU implementation. Anybody tell me what the RCU implementation should do instead? What should this look like? Yeah. Very good. Excellent. That's exactly what has to happen, just like that. So it has to extend so we cover that reader. And then the guy, any, everybody who might have that old formation has let go of it before we go and free things. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. This, this is for people that might want to review the slides afterwards. Um, and this is just some things that might be used for, which, again, we don't want to worry about. And, and it actually is used, but not as much as locking. Here are some uh, URLs you might look at to uh, uh, take, get more information on how it works and more detail on, on what you do with it. So it has advantages and disadvantages. It's not, um, it's not something you use everywhere. Um, you use it where you care about the low overhead, the dermis reside, deadlock immunity, um, and not having to do as much work in some cases, and easier handling of new references and, uh, against deletions. Um, if updates need to be really fast, it might not be your first choice. If, um, if you're updating fairly often, then the fact that the stuff you remove goes cold in the cache before it's freed, so what normally happens, you free something, you put it in the, in the free list, somebody else immediately allocates and uses it, it still is hot in that CPU's cache, so it's very fast, um, and that is disabled with RCU because you remove it, you wait for several milliseconds for a grace period, and then by that time it's drained out of CPU's caches and you get misses. Uh, updates run concurrently with readers, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing, but it's sometimes surprising. The thing we're worried about in this talk is the fact that it only runs in kernels. And the difficulty is two things. The Linux kernel implementation of RCU is extremely forgiving. You can do things like forget the RCU read lock, forget the RCU read unlock, and just sort of have the code there, and it'll mostly work. And we'll talk about an actual case where this caused me great pain last year. So we need something that's less forgiving, yet if we do that in the kernel, um, we end up causing some great pain through other parts of the kernel. And this is the... Uh, case of being too forgiving. So there's this uh, real-time RCU, preemptible RCU, that uh, made it to mainline about a year ago. And things were looking good. It was working. I, I tested like crazy, and it was passing all the tests with all the configurations. And about five months later, Alexi says, you know, um, if I run this uh, kernel build thing, I'm doing 170 parallel kernel builds with a bunch of different configurations. And so I say, hmm, OK, well, I'll try that. And I tried it, and uh, I couldn't make it fail. So we went back and forth on what was going on. I sent him my config. I never got a config from him. Um, and eventually, on June, he actually tries RCU torture, which is a test suite I wrote to really just hammer RCU really hard and make sure it's working. Well, he tries it, and it just falls over right away. And, and I can run RCU torture all day. I can run it for, for, for many days, and, it, and I can't make it fail. So we're going back and forth what was going on, and, and about a month later, uh, Nick I'm going, okay, well, you know, and I still can't produce that either. So I've been beating my head against the code for months, trying to figure out what's going on, inspecting it, running tests, making RCU torture more nasty, and nothing. So uh, Nick actually went and did a whole bunch of work um, instrumenting RCU and uh, Doing, uh, uh, checking it out and doing a bunch of stuff, and, and eventually finds a bug. It turns out that uh, the test setup I was using would silently override me if I said CPU hot plug equals n. And the reason it would do that it, they're selected, so you must have meant to enable this, so I'll enable it for you. So I thought I was testing with CPU hot plug equals n, and I wasn't. And I had a really stupid bug. I was just failing to initialize at all in the case where CPU hot plug equals n, which caused preemptive RCU to conclude, there are no CPUs on the system. I don't have to wait for any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and what that meant is instead of uh, carefully waiting for all the RCU read unlocks to show up to go there, it was just waiting for about a few tens of milliseconds, saying, OK, good enough, we're done. And the amazing thing was is that even with it being totally broken in that way, 
it was still taking Alexi on anything resembling a normal workload. I mean, RCU torture is not a normal workload, all right? It's, it's useful. It's saved me a lot of times. Not in this case, I'm afraid, but it has saved me a bunch of times. Um, it was taking him two days on a two-CP machine with 170 parallel kernel builds for it to fail sometimes. Now, Nick, uh, uh, when he found the bug, he had this uh, thing here. Annoyed this wasn't a crazy obscure error in the algorithm I could fix. Spent all day debugging it. Had to make a special case case. RCU torture didn't seem to trigger it. And a big RCU state logging sure should log millions of RCU trait, straight transitions and events. Oh, well. So this guy was disappointed that it was a simple, stupid bug on my part and not something uh, obscure. And Alexi's response uh, also did a quite a bit to help me understand why he wasn't sending me a doc config file. Bastard. <laughs> uh, in a response to Nick. So he was upset because he didn't find the bug first. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, I guess uh, you could have worse problems. But, but the thing is, Just what does... Please, <laughs> please, please, please. You know how much time I burn chasing this thing? I would select as evil. Select as evil? Um, it's evil. It's, 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 it, was, it, cert uh, it certainly caused me a fair amount of pain. <laughs> It's useful in other cases. Yes. I like that. I would have been happy if it would have. Uh, what I did was I wrote a script. Um, uh, I got, we have this infrastructure where you just put in the list of config things you want, and it's a web based thing. And so I made it so I cut and paste that and dump it down the script in the build directory. And it would generate a C program that would yell at me if any of the things weren't, weren't set the way I'd asked them to be. So that was, that was what I eventually did to get around that, but, or at least to yell at myself if that happened. So and, and I'm not sure why, uh, why um, what it was, it was uh, suspend resume was one of them, and I can't remember the other one. But for some reason, if you have suspend resume or the other one, you have to have CPU hot plug. Yes. Um, I guess it would be, and, I'm, and the thing is, is that this is kind of an automated thing. I'm sure if I was to have done it in xconfig, that it would have just disappeared and not let me change it or something, but maybe not, I don't know. Okay, but this was uh, using an automated thing. It was just using a script to, to do patch, apply patches to the config file, so, uh, oh well. So I'm not gonna go through in detail what you have to do to have a working RCU configuration. You can look at that later, but um, it became really obvious that this is important because if you can have it so where RCU isn't doing anything at all besides delaying, and have the system be actually pretty stable. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think that running 170 parallel kernel makes on a two CPU machine is, is, is a kind of excessive level of stress. Although I'm glad he did it because otherwise you'd have the bug still in there. Okay. But uh, if that's what it takes to come up with a case, and what that was simulating was just all of the RC read locks and all the RC read unlocks just being dropped out of the kernel, all gone. You know, somebody did this horrible bug that just they didn't, didn't use it correctly at all. And still it was pretty stable. So obviously we need something a little bit better to really stress test, really heavily stress test RCU algorithms. Okay, we be careful, and that's good. There's some, there is some uh, sparse testing of them a little bit. But, you know, uh, we need, you need to get the answer in less than two days. So my thought was to do this in user level. One might try to do it in kernel level, but the thing is, is that you need the grace period in, for some of the abuse. For example, if you just moved an RCU, you, you, if you just had the RCU unlock too early, so you're doing some work after you got out of the read side critical section, which you're not supposed to do. You need the critical section to cover the whole mess. Um, you're going to get there pretty quickly in you know, hundreds of nanoseconds or microseconds. If I tweak the RCUs we have in the kernel now to make a grace period close in 100 nanoseconds, um, that kernel is going to be kind of unusable. Okay. I mean, you could crank Hertz up to, what, uh, you know, 10 million or something like that, but I don't think that'll work. Uh, or you could uh, do any number of other things that just involve, like, grabbing several CPUs and having them do nothing but stare at the configuration, which certainly isn't going to work very well on a unit processor. Yes? Could you have the, um, the task schedule away on doing an RCU unlock, a read RCU unlock? Hold, uh, so the question was, could you make the task schedule away on doing an re RCU read unlock? Hold that thought that we're doing something similar. Um, there are some, you could in some cases, but the problem is that you're allowed to use RC read unlock, for example, in NMI handlers. 
Okay. So we could do something like if not, a, yeah, we could, we could, we could do something kind of like that. Um, and I, and uh, to be honest with you, I didn't think, well, the other reason I didn't think of it, okay. <laughs> you might be able to busy loop. Yeah, you, it's, uh, you, there, there's a bunch of things you could do and, and all the ones I thought of, I didn't think of that one, okay, but all the ones I thought of had uh, some serious side effects that I decided were probably not good. So the, the, at that point, it's kind of like, well, uh, in fact, Rusty did a bunch of stuff on this with pulling stuff into user mode and just pounding, pounding it to smithereens. And OK, well, you know, it's good enough for Rusty. What the heck, right? So the, um, let me make sure I, I understood that correctly. One idea would be to have a scheduling encounter used in, in user space. Is this, is this a way to implement RC in user space or, uh, or well, as a? One string to pull. OK. Um, but that, that might be worth talking about. I'm, I'll, I'll go through what I actually did, but I'd like to talk to you about uh, what, how that might work. So user level RCU itself has several challenges. Uh, one thing, if you look at an RCU implementation, it does SMP processor ID a lot. And well, you can sort of do that kind of, but you might be on some other, other CPU like that. There's nothing stopping the scheduler from deciding to move you. You also can't portably disable preemption. In fact, a lot of kernel hackers would refer you not do that at all. We had a lot of an argument with Oracle some years ago about that, in fact. And there's no equivalent of an in-kernel scheduling clock interrupt. I mean, there's signals, but the problem is a lot of applications want to use signals for their own purposes, and they're not going to be really happy with uh, RCU stealing it. And the other thing is if you were going into more general, if, you, if we're going to do this in user space, you might as well make it so applications use it, right? And if we do that, the problem is you write an RCU library not only do you not know what the applications using it now are, uh, another application might not be written yet. And so you can't make any assumptions about what the application can do. And, and in particular, you can't assume that the application is going to call RCU QSCTR Inc. every so often, which is what the in-kernel version requires. Okay. So what do we do? Well, what we do here, instead of focusing on CPUs, we focus on processes or threads. And that's a little bit of a cheat because, in theory, you could have millions of threads, but um, I'm willing to take a limited thing where we only support a couple hundred as a start. Okay? And if somebody needs more later, we can worry about it later. So we can't disable preemption, but on the other hand, if we focus on a processor thread, then we don't need to disable preemption because the thread can't preempt away from itself. I mean, no matter what it does, it's still that thread. All right? Um, now, the. Uh, in kernel scheduling clock interrupt, there's a couple ways we can deal with this. One is to drive grace pre is totally from the update side primitives. In other words, you do a synchronized RCU and it go, instead of just waiting for things to happen in the background, it actually active, actively goes and detects the end of the grace period. And that's what I do in a number of cases. Uh, that has some consequences. The other thing is to provide separate threads for this purpose. In other words, have a thread whose job it is to close grace periods from time to time. And I've gone with this initially. Maybe this would be this may be something we would have to do if we wanted to scale to thousands or hundreds of thousands of threads. Let's control the application. Well, okay, we'll just we're not going to control the application. However, if we don't control the application, we have to add some overhead, some of the primitives, and therefore we have a more optimized version, uh, which we'll see. Okay, this is a really really simple RCU. It's not something you would use if you care about performance, but in this case, we care about bug finding, right? So RC read lock. We have a global variable, and we atomically increment it. And that's, by the way, going to be really, really slow on a big multiprocessor. But again, um, performance is taking a bit of a back seat for this bug finding exercise at this point. And also, we can't optimize this. I just want to start this way. Now, we also, in this case, need an SMPMB here, because uh, the way that the kernel gets away with this is that they know they have the scheduling clock interrupt. And so what happens is the scheduling clock interrupt sees, oh, the state changed. And if it needs to, it does an SMB, OK? Because it just requires a processor to do the memory barrier. Uh, the fact that it does it in an interrupt as opposed to in the mainline code is it's OK. It doesn't matter. In this case, we don't have the interrupt. So we're just going to take it in the shorts. We're going to do the memory barrier here. Besides, if we're atomically incrementing a global variable, you know, who cares about a memory barrier, right? Uh, so can we be scheduled from one CPU to another between those two lines of code? Indeed, we can. So this is a global variable. What happens is we'll have atomically increment the global variable. So let's say it was zero. There was nobody in a reset critical section. It'll now be one. 
if we get scheduled another CPU, the context switch code has to do the memory barriers for us because otherwise the CPU that knew the task needs to be able to see what it did on the other CPU. Um, so we're covered there. And because it's a global variable, if somebody else were to do one, they'd, get, they'd either be the one that incremented one or the one that incremented two. Either way, it's now two. Okay. Um, so, be, go ahead. Yes, I, I, uh, I, I was too lazy to put that in my user code stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, the, the point, very good point. There's an optimized version of SMPMB that um, is used after Atomic Inc. The reason for that is things like x86 uh, and Atomic Inc. implies a memory barrier, just naturally. Uh, other things like power and I think itanium, uh, the Atomic Inc. Uh, doesn't necessarily make a barrier, so you have to do one yourself. And by having a SMP, a SMPMB after Atomic Inc. or something like that, I'd have to look it up. Uh, what it does is, depending on your architecture, either it does a memory barrier or it doesn't, depending on whether it needs to. So yeah, good, good point. And then unlock, we just do it in the reverse. We need to have this memory barrier to make sure that the read side critical section stays in the read side critical section uh, for the processors where Atomic Inc. doesn't apply it. And then we just decrement it. Um, we could just use a write barrier, I think. Um, the reason, but the thing is, is that you might have a read in here that needs to stay inside. Okay. Uh, because you might just be going down a list. So I think it needs to be a full barrier. Um, yeah, for x86, you don't care. He cares about power, though. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, this is horribly expensive, um, but it's, it's pretty simple. Basically, in the update side, um, it's pretty straightforward with one proviso. All we have to do is, uh, I'm not sure why I have the T. I'm sorry, ignore that. Um, we just have a memory barrier, and then we just sit, and we, and we do that to make sure that the update we did is seen before we go and check what everybody else is doing. We just hear spinning until the thing gets, ends up being zero. Good point. Very good. That's, uh, he beat me to this part right here. Uh, what if it never gets to zero? It might not. You know, it could be that you have a lot of CPUs, and there's always somebody in a reset critical section at all times, in which case this will wait forever. So. Uh, one, one thing you can do is you can have two counters and flip their roles back and forth. Um, but I wanted to show the absolute bonehead simplest possible thing. So that's good debugging. Yes? So. So I've, I've, got, I've, got, I've done somewhere between 10 or 15 different little tweaks on, on this. And uh, what I'll do is I'll show an even stupider one than this in a moment. And then I'll go through one of the, one of the smarter ones. Okay. So if you thought that was trivial, try that. For one thing, both the read and update side fit on one page. All right. Um, and what we're going to do is when we do RC read lock, we're just going to grab a global spin lock. All right. And RC read lock is going to release it. I mean, who needs read side parallelism anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're debugging here. And synchronized RCU, uh, people uh, looked at networking code in 2.4 may kind of recognize this, this approach to life. Um, they had something kind of similar. Um, you just acquire the lock and then immediately release it. Well, you can't acquire the lock until all the readers are done, and then, and then they're all gone, and then you release it, and you're, and you're happy. Although it may be a little slower than you'd like. Um, and of course, there's one other problem. With normal RCU, you could have a case where you, ha where you acquire a lock, do an RC read, read lock, do some stuff, RC read unlock, release the lock. And somewhere else, with that same lock, RC read lock, and then acquire the lock, do something, and release the lock, and then RC read unlock. Try that with this puppy, and you'll deadlock. Okay? So, um, uh, it, it's, uh, you, this, is, this is really simple and stupid. It's a kind of a way of explaining how things work. But if you try that on an arbitrary algorithm in the kernel, um, it, it's not going to cut it for you. Ooh, multiple locks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so this it's kind of like. This is happy that when, when we shut down the uh, network lock, we, uh, we used to have a few locks that we lock and unlock to make sure all the uh, transmitters are blocked. Now we have multiple mapping blocks to do with that one. That's made like something that Dash used to use before, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, um, and the thing is, there can only be one reader. You'd have to wait for the reader, but there can only be one of them at a time. Yeah, there's no, there's yeah, there's no no read side parallelism, so there's no concurrency. This is a bad this is a bad solution, but a 
but uh, one that meets the letter of the law of RCU. <laughs> uh, semantics, right? Okay. So uh, I'm not sure if he's getting a picture of the slide. Yeah, it looks like he is, so I'll let me get a picture of the slide. All right. Um, there's some other approaches. I'm not going to go in detail with these, but I'm going to take one particular one and, and deal with it a little bit better. Uh, split counter is what gets around uh, Dave's objection about, hey, it might never get to zero. So you just use a pair of them. Uh, and uh, you can also have a per thread split, split counter, um, which uh, I'm not going to go through this. If somebody immediately spots what the bug in this is, I'll, I'll be very impressed and shake your hand and, and have you look at inspect my code in the future. Uh, but there is a bug. Uh, and there's an easy workaround. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a little bit better approach that actually gets read side parallelism and uh, has low cost on the read side and, and the update isn't too bad either. What we're going to do is we're going to have a global counter again, but what we're going to do is the readers aren't going to mess with it. They're going to look at it, but they're never, never going to change it. The updaters are going to add two to it each time they want to do a grace period. So it's only going to take on even values. And so it would look like uh, this guy here, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. Okay, so this white line, which I don't know if you can see the color from there, um, is the global counter right here. Each reader, each reader thread, is going to have its own counter. And it's, what it's going to do is it's going to pick up this value. It's going to add one to it and put it in its copy. So a given thread might have something like this bluish line, which may or not be distinguishable. Starts off at 0, goes up to 3. Okay. So th at this point, while it's three, it's in a read side critical section. And then um, uh, goes up and uh, eventually goes to four at the unlock, so now it's even value. So a given thread, if it's inside a read side critical section, it has an odd numbered value in its counter. If it's outside, it's an even value. Furthermore, we can tell which the old and the new ones are. Okay, because um, an old counter. So right, right here, for example, uh, we went up, we became two. This is a new one because it's bigger. All right. At this point, once we try to do another grace period, it's now old, it's smaller. So all we have to do is wait until each thread's counter is either even or greater than the current value we've got there. And at that point, the grace period is ended. Okay. And the cool thing about this is that if you're in user mode and the thread goes off and blocks outside a read side critical section forever, it stays even and you can ignore it. Okay, you don't, it's not, you don't have to do something weird to uh, either track it or uh, there are some ways of getting around that, but, um, and I may implement some of them at some point if I need to, but I decided not to this year or this past year. So the read site is really trivial again. Um, and I get thread var is kind of like get CPU var. Uh, uh, I sort of plagiarized, half plagiarized the kernel interface, which of course changed now, so I'm out of date, but hey, you know. Um, anyway, we just take the global counter, we add one to it, we stick it on our value, and we still, need the read, we still need the memory barrier because we need to keep the read side critical section inside. And this, again, is a consequence of the fact we don't have the equivalent of the scheduling clock interrupt at user level. And unlock, we just do the opposite thing. We do the barrier, again, to keep the critical section inside. And then we just copy the value directly, which means at this point we have an even value and we're seen as being outside. There is one uh, problem here. I'll, I'll give us a couple seconds if somebody wants to try to spot it. Go ahead. Wraparound, Wraparound actually should be handled um, because we, what, what I do, uh, I'll show you in the next page. Uh, yes? Nesting. Very good. Exactly. Nesting. If we, if we, do, if we, if we nest, we'll, we'll, we're, we're in a retag critical section, and then somebody says, I want a grace period, and then we nest, and suddenly we look like we didn't start before it did, and, and that's bad. Okay. So um, to, to your point, which was... Uh, uh, which was about the update side, what it was going to do. Um, what we're going to do, uh, we have a memory barrier, again, to separate things out. Spin locks have memory barriers, but not all architectures guarantee that they're impermeable both directions. We add two to the global counter. We have another memory barrier. And then we go through each thread. And while that thread is odd and it's smaller than the current value, we wait. I, you could pull, but if I'm going to make it real nasty, I'll comment out that pull so that the grace period close really quickly, right? If I was doing it for efficiency, I might wait a few milliseconds each round to avoid chewing up extra CPU. But I'm not worried about extra CPU. I'm worried about finding bugs. And then we release the lock, do another memory barrier, and we can then do our destructive operations. So again, this ends up being pretty simple. 
Um, and it uh, also allows us, by removing this weight, to get through a grace period extremely quickly. Okay? If there's one guy we're waiting for in reach side critical section, as soon as he releases it, we'll see it and continue. All right. So let's see here. So we've got uh, this doesn't a bunch. If you're looking for a production quality thing, it does a bunch of things fairly nicely, as Rusty noted. We don't have freely nestable read side primitives, and also because we have a global lock, our upside, update site is not scalable. And the read side is deterministic, and it's reasonably low overhead. But you got that memory barrier there, which isn't perfect. So I, I call it yellow, saying it's it's okay, but not great. Uh, at this point, I'm going to. There's another one that gets around the the uh, nestability thing, but I'm not going to go through that in detail. I'd be happy to talk about it later. Um, just kind of have a fat bottom bit, and if you do that, then you get rid of the problem about nesting them, but you still have the other problems. The update diet size scalability can be taken care of in a number of ways, but I'm not going to worry about that much at this point. What I'm going to do instead is talk about RCU torture, because that's what we use to test this. What I did was, uh, well, so what, what RCU torture does in this case is we have an array of structures. Okay? And the readers go traverse this RCU stress current pointer, look at this value, and uh, sit there for a while, and then verify the value is either 1 or 0. We'll talk about why that works later. What the updater does is advances the pointer, okay, uh, increments each value modulo the number of elements in the array. So this is going to become 1, this is going to become 0, this will become 7, and so on. And then, uh, and then uh, and, uh, does a synchronized RCU. All right. So what happens after he's done that, we have something looking like this. RCU stress current is advanced to the new place. So the new readers will come in here. There might still be some old readers that picked up the old value but didn't look at this yet. So that's why this is gray. There might still be some people here. There better not be anybody here because that would have been two, uh, two grace periods ago. So readers can see 0, they can see 1. If they see a 2 or bigger, RCU is broken. And it complains bitterly about that. And this is the code that goes through that. I'm not going to, it's not all that important. I'm not going to look at it carefully. This is the reader code. We RC read lock. We pick up the pointer. We sin, spit spinning for a little bit just to force some time to pass. And then we pick up the pipe count, which is the, the number inside the array element you saw. We do RC read lock, and then we do some checking afterwards. I'm sorry? Oh, I, um, uh, that's a global variable, so I'm, I, I force it. I, I force the compiler to keep track of that because, it, because the value goes out, outside of what it can see. So it, yes, but um, th that was a mistake I did actually make, was to, <laughs> was to fail to force the compiler to actually generate that code. So the, what I do to force, what I'm going to do, it would be illegal to move this statement outside of the RC reside critical section. Okay, because this is, uh, we've got an RC to reference, we pick up this pointer, and then we're dereferencing the pointer. That has to stay in the RC critical section to be legal. Since I'm trying to find bugs, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse the order of those two statements, as shown down here in red. I'm going to add some malice to RC read unlock in order to uh, force the raise the probability of catching this as a problem. And since I'm picking this up out here, now it's perfectly legal for RCU to go and go through many grace periods right here between those two statements. So I should be able to see violations. And it's a good thing if RCU can detect those. I mean, that's what we're trying to do is catch problems like that. And this is the uh, results of doing that. Um, I've got a bunch of different implementations. Um, RCU lock is the stupid one with just a single global lock. RCU RCG is the stupid one with a single global reference count. This one uh, takes the thing of splitting the reference counts, as was suggested. This one uh, has a per thread version, this one, and this one uh, has a faster update. I'm not going to go through what all of these do. But um, I have the read side performance on 60, 64 CPUs. In other words, you have 64 threads all running concurrently, doing nothing but RC read lock, RC read unlock. And you look at the time it takes for each one to go by. And this is not particularly optimized. Uh, but as you can see, um, if you have the global lock, um, you're up at 17 microseconds, which is pretty horrible. And if you use the uh, reference, global reference counters, you're even worse. Okay. So uh, what we do is we, for the malice, what we do is we just put a little for loop in there. 
Uh, and again, we do the tricks to make sure the compiler doesn't uh, mess us up. But uh, we either don't have a for loop at all, so this is normal RC read unlock, or we spin 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times on a local variable. And um, uh, one thing you can see is that uh, the single lock is kind of uh, malicious by, uh, from, from this point just by its very existence. You've got about a one out of five chance of catching the problem uh, when you do that. Uh, whereas so these other guys aren't, uh, if it's blank, that means we ran 10 seconds going full bore, going through that torture, and we didn't catch any problems. As you increase, you get higher and higher probability of catching that bug. Um, and also, it's much more even. You end up with uh, the, one, the higher performance guys here. I mean, you can see initially the guys with the poor performance are the ones that are being caught. As you go out here, even the low performance ones, except for these two guys. The reason is that these two guys work in user space the way that um, RC read lock works in the kernel with not config preempt. And as a result, the grace period really is kind of a sloppy thing. And so we just never detect it, no matter how long we do it, because the grace period is determined not by where you put RC read unlock and RC read lock, but rather where you denote a quiescent state. Um, so uh, you have to use one of the uh, not super efficient versions to make this happen. Yes. That, that's absolutely right. The, the key thing about these is that they force the, they, they require you know something about the application. So you couldn't use these in an arbitrary library. You would have to, the application would have to call the quiescent state thing periodically um, to make it work. Or, go ahead. Yeah, uh, event driven application, one thing. If you have, also, if you, there's a, this particular code, I have a way of saying, look, uh, don't pay attention to me anymore because I'm going off for a long time. For example, if you're reading from the network. Um, and then you come back in. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I seem to have a problem with initialization errors in RCU because I had a mess up in this guy where I wasn't uh, causing the thread to say he was there initially. So, yeah, thank you. Um, and we're almost there. So this is just some future work. Um, I just have bare bones and not the rest of the API. Uh, and uh, I'd like to actually make this try this in user level applications. Uh, and there's, there's some students at one of the universities in the, in the states that have been thinking about this. I'm not sure if they're going to make it happen or not, but it'd be really cool if they did. And uh, so it looks like user RCU is, level RCU is really as possible, even for library functions. We end up with good grace period latency, really low, as in uh, you know, hundreds of nanoseconds, and not bad read side performance. And we end up with full RCU semantics, even with the stupid implementations. Uh, there's some more stuff you can look at if you want to know more about RCU. And I've actually got the source code for these user-level RC implementations available in this, in this Git tree here, um, along with some write-ups on them. So, and they're available under GPL v2 or later. Um, I'm sorry, I, uh, uh, it took me five and a half years to get GPL v2 or later. I don't have LGPL. With that, thank you all very much for your time and attention, and uh, see how things go.